So I feel very strongly that there are some things that you are supposed to eat all year long. And one of those things is ice cream. Now when you come to the farmer's market right here in Hamilton, you have a great option. Whether you're looking for coconut chocolate chip sorbet, which is dairy free, or a multitude of flavors of really good quality, rich, decadent ice cream, you're gonna find that right here. We're gonna go meet Karen at Henry Brown's Small Batch Ice Cream. We are in the Hamilton Farmer's Market, one of my favorite places to be. Karen, I'm so glad to be back here with you with some incredible stuff. What are you making for us today? Well, I'm really excited to be showing everyone how to make our rich chocolate ice cream. Rich, rich chocolate, chocolate ice cream. Say that, let's, let's say that again. Rich, rich chocolate, chocolate ice, ice cream. cream. <laughs> right on. <laughs> that is my favorite. So this is an ice cream that's actually made with two ice creams. We okay. start with something called our vanilla base, and right. we use that for a lot of different flavors. And to that, we add another flavor. It's called the darkness. The darkness? Yes, it's our dark Dar chocolate ice cream. Like the band. Like, well, inspired by the band. Okay, but it's a I like really it. I like it. Rich dark ice cream, and we often mix that with different uh, mix-ins. Like uh, we had a cake and loaf uh, Easter cream egg brownie oh. one year. It, it was one of our most popular flavors ever. But it's also the underpinning of our rich chocolate. All right. So, okay. But I'm going to show you how to make the vanilla base today. Let's do it. All right. Pretty straightforward. We start with some organic fair trade raw sugar. Amazing. It has a lot of flavor to it. If you can see that it's a little bit brown, mm -hmm. that's that natural molasses still in the sugar. I think it's one of the things that makes our ice cream kind of unique. So yeah. it's just not regular refined sugar. Not Great flavors. It really has a lot more depth to it than just regular sugar. Exactly. So to that, I've just added a pinch of salt. Okay. And then we have our liquid ingredients. We have some beautiful whole milk, homogenized milk. Okay. And we get that from Hewitt's Dairy in Hagersville. And we get our cream from Hewitt's as well. Okay, so Hagersville, cream, I'll tell you right now. So I'm a Haldeman County boy with Twisted Lemon in Cayuga, and Hewitt's Dairy is some of the best dairy you're gonna get. And they have a very famous ice cream bar, too. They do, indeed. Yeah. But we're not talking about their ice cream today. We're talking about your ice cream today. Yeah, it's all about Henry Brown's. That's right. <laughs> right. So we've got the wet and the dry ingredients together, and then we whisk them. I love this whisk. It breaks up the sugar really nicely. So explain to me why you put salt in, because I don't think most people would ever expect there to be salt in an ice cream base. It's one of those things that's required to just balance the flavor and enhance the flavor of the dairy. It's, it's, you'll find salt added to even cookie recipes. Your Absolutely. classic chocolate chip cookie needs that. So we add a little bit, just, just enough to do that. Now there's one other flavor component. We call this a vanilla base. A whole tablespoon of our Madagascar bourbon vanilla. Sorry, you said Madagascar bourbon I vanilla? I did. It's a beautiful way of extracting the flavor from the vanilla bean, mm. and the bourbon also imparts a special flavor, and the Madagascar beans are known around the world as being Some of the, the best. best. So that's how we make the vanilla base. Now, to make our rich chocolate ice cream, we use one of these big containers okay. and a larger amount of the vanilla base. Now you've chilled this base, right? Yes, thoroughly. So, thoroughly. So you've taken the base that we've just that you've just mixed and you've chilled it. So you're bringing the temperature to something a little bit more realistic before it goes into the machine. That's right. It needs to chill for at least two hours or overnight. Some mixtures definitely benefit from an overnight soak. So for example, the darkness, yes. the chocolate, the cocoa, it needs some time to bloom in the liquid for the flavors to fully develop and, and marry. I think that's the expression mm -hmm. that can be used. Um, so we're gonna add some of that. Oh, and so we so combine good. those two. You don't really need to chill them again at this stage. Uh, we have machines that actually chill the ice cream in the machine. So you're not messing around when you say like small batch ice cream, you're doing like a couple of portions at a time and you're not trying to do this on a large scale. You're really, it just really seems like you're absolutely focused on the best quality ice cream right here, right now. We, we do our best and because we are working with such small batches, there's a couple of advantages to that. Um, it means that we're turning over a product that's really fresh so we don't need to add preservatives, stabilizers or texturizers. It's just the way that you would make ice cream at home. 100% natural. It also means that we can 
feature a wide number of flavors and experiment. And we've done some pretty kooky flavors. That's great. So to get this going, we hit the power button and we can give it a chance to pre-cool. And once it's pre-cool, you can start it spinning. After the ice cream's had 45 minutes to freeze, it comes out with a texture that's kind of like a soft serve ice cream. Mm -hmm. So we take it out of the uh, bucket and then we put that ice cream in one of our pint containers right. and then we put that in the deep freeze. Um, it needs at least two hours to set so that it's a full solid ice cream texture. So this is ready? Okay, it's ready. Want to pee? Yeah, yeah, I do. Okay, there I it do. is. Oh. And all of its rich chocolate glory. So it's a really good idea to take your piece, your container of ice cream mm -hmm. and let it sit on your countertop. Let it sit there for about five minutes to soften a little okay. bit. And then you spoon it. Especially with a, a more authentic small batch ice cream where we haven't loaded it full of air, it does have a more dense texture. So you do need to take that extra bit of time. And then into a glass for serving. Oh. And uh, we've started making our own uh, chocolate syrup now. So you make all your own syrups too? We make our own syrups and sauces. Okay. And uh, for a chocolate uh, fudge, we make our own right here in the market. So this is what I call a saucy squiggle. And we offer sprinkles too. The okay. kids seem to really love those. For sure. And. A saucy squiggle. Yes. This is obviously the very technical term for what you put on top of your ice cream. From here on in, I will never serve ice cream without a saucy squiggle. Okay, I'm not, I'm not waiting anymore. I've been watching this for the last 45 minutes. Oh, like it is just perfect texture. There's no artificial colors, no artificial anything, just the real deal ice cream that you would make at home or that your grandmother might have made. This is so chocolatey. I love oh. it, I love that reaction. This is so <laughs> chocolatey, I just needed a, a second to myself. I understand. This is one of the most enjoyable things about what I do, just watching people react to the flavors. This is so decadent and so rich. Like when I put my spoon through this, like you can see how perfect that texture is. This is absolutely incredible. Karen, thank you so much. This is just, this is the way I wanna start my day every day <laughs> is eating this ice cream. And for that, I thank you so much. My name is Chef Dan. You have to get them to the, to the Hamilton Farmer's Market, to Henry Brown's Small Batch Ice Cream. Come talk to Karen and she will make you her saucy squiggle right here on Hamilton Eats. Onions are in everything, and to properly dice it, I'm gonna show you how. Keep the root end on, and we're going to pull the tips off the front, slice this in half, and pull the papery skin, depending on the onion itself, but pull the papery skin off the outside, leaving this piece on so that we can slice horizontally through a few times. Making sure to be careful and not to cut yourself. And then we're gonna slice vertically a few times so that what we've done is we've kept it whole so it doesn't fall apart. And now we can, in just a couple of knife strokes, have perfectly diced onions ready for almost any recipe. That is how you dice an onion. So whether you're from Hamilton or whether you're new to Hamilton, it's almost guaranteed that you've heard of Cake and Loaf Bakery. Now today is really exciting because Cake and Loaf, their original location on Dundurn Street has now expanded and you can get them right here in the Hamilton Farmer's Market. So today we're gonna go in and we're gonna meet the chocolatier and manager right here at Cake and Loaf Bakery. We're gonna go in and we're gonna meet Maria. in the bake shop right here 
at Cake and Loaf Maria. I'm so happy to be here. This is not my forte, so I am always excited when uh, somebody else is going to show me. It is exciting. Show me this. So what, what are you making today? Uh, we're going to make our big score cookie. It has been super popular since we started it, and we can do a day without it. Oh, let me tell you, this big score cookie has a reputation in Hamilton and if you haven't had it you have to get this so show me how this works yeah so we already started with our butter and the sugars we have brown sugar and white sugar um, we're going to add our eggs to uh, incorporate everything a little bit of our vanilla bean paste a vanilla bean paste so yeah. it's not just an extract it's not an extract we don't necessarily like using the extract all the time the paste makes it a little uh, it gives it a little bit more kick so okay i've never actually used vanilla bean paste it, before it is neat. yeah it's really good so now we just mix everything and make sure it's incorporated so you started by like sort of creaming your sugar yeah. and your and your melted butter yeah we at call the it beginning. liquefying the sugar because yeah. sugar is a liquefier it gets kind of like liquid when you uh, cream it with uh, something wet uh, so now we're just going to make sure the sides are clean it's one of the rules in baking. I can really smell that vanilla. Yeah. And like then, I think even more than normal. And then we're going to add our dry ingredients. So it's uh, flour. Is it all-purpose flour, uh, baking we use, flour, cake we, flour? We use all-purpose flour, um, salt and baking soda. And then we're just going to combine everything. And here you just want to be careful that you don't overmix your cookie dough. Otherwise you just get a a tough cookie who doesn't spread. So how do you know when your cookie dough is mixed properly? It's all experience. All right. So now slowly I am going to add our scorbits. And just a little bit of scorbits in there, bit, right? right? Like we don't yeah, want to no, overdo no, it. Like, no, that like would be... two cups was just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if you're gonna do it, you might as well do it right. Now it's all together, one cohesive mass. I love it. And we can uh, we can start scooping. Oh, I get to do this One too. One scoop for you too. I've been hired. <laughs> so just nice and flat. So a nice level. Yeah. Like so. Yeah. And, and how then, far apart do I need to put uh, these on here? Are they going to expand? Yes, they are. We're going to do uh, three and two. I see. Okay. So you're really sort of offsetting these so that no matter what happens with these cookies, they're going to have enough room to actually sort of stretch out and not become one big cookie mass. So now you just give them a little oven. A little oven. A little oh, oven. That's so yeah. tender and, and incredible. Tap them down a little bit and then they're ready to go in the oven. Excellent. So the cookies have cooled now. Uh, just pulled them out of the oven. Uh, so now I'm going to uh, give everyone a just like a little dollop of our Swiss meringue buttercream and we're going to make a little barrier for the caramel so it doesn't all seek into the cookie and then oh just a little bit just a little bit you know <laughs> I mean we're very serious about our baked goods at cake and loaf so and then our house made salted caramel oh, just in the my. center Goodness. You know, once I finish the last one, I'm going to have you um, add our score bits on it because there okay. weren't enough in the cookie, right? That's right, because so, there wasn't enough that went into the actual yeah. batter. <laughs> I get to put more of the score bits on to this cookie sandwich. That's just, look, okay, so show me one. So show me how I this will one, start how this with happens. this one. So you just take it and then kind of like... So you're doing this in. before you even put your lid on. Yeah, because do you see now you have still buttercream. So if you put your lid on, that oh. buttercream will actually help it stick together. I see. Okay, so let me let me see, make sure that I'm doing this right. So yeah. I'm going to hold this on the side, and I'm going to just sort of coat the outside, yeah. letting any excess fall back into perfect the uh, into the bowl, so that we don't lose anything. Just like that. Yeah. And that's perfect. it. Then this goes down, and you put your lid on. Yeah. So I, I have played in the kitchen from time to time. And uh, I don't ever shy away from an opportunity to try something new. And, uh, you know, I've made my share of cookies and ice cream sandwiches and cookie sandwiches. But I'll tell you, what you've just put together for me now, I might possibly try to recreate for my kids and stuff at home. But I don't know whether I would want to. Or you just to. come and visit us at the I, Well, I think that's it. I'm just going to yeah. say, you know what, little guy? We are going to go and visit Maria. <laughs> and we are going to just make sure 
that we get it done right. Look at that. That is just an exceptional looking dessert. So that's it. So we put lids yeah. on. Now we just gently uh, just flop it on and then press it down just a touch so you don't ooze, like have the caramel ooze so out. We're not right? trying to squish this into no, a pancake or anything. It just holds. As soon as you bite into it, you, you, will, you will know. I'll know. You might thank me to give you a little bit more. Okay. You know, so room. Marie wasn't messing around when she said that I it was a bit of a messy sandwich. So I didn't just get a napkin. I got a stack of napkins. And that's kind of the only way yeah. I think that this is going to go down. <laughs> and I'm not going to hesitate anymore because I can't. And you know what? This is still good because it's cool, yeah. but it's still a little bit warm. Look at the score bits and the caramel. Like, it's just everything about this is going to be good. All right. Oh, my goodness. Mmm. The score isn't quite as overpowering as I thought it might initially be. Yeah. Being the amount that's actually in here, the cookie is nice. That buttercream is so nice. It's not nearly as sweet as I think no. you would you would yeah, think. And that's American where that balance is. Yeah, the American buttercream is like the the more sweeter one. So it kind of like balances it a little bit more. Okay, I gotta I gotta show this. Everybody at home needs to see this part right here. Look, that is a cookie sandwich right there. If you haven't made your way here into the market to try these cookie sandwiches. You absolutely have to. Marie, I'm so happy that you put this together for us today. My name is Chef Dan. This is Hamilton Eats. That's so good. That really, really is good. So in downtown Dundas, at the corners of Cross Street and Park Street, you go down the back alley, you're gonna find yourself a whole big pile of wood and an ax that's dedicated to the flavor of wood fire pizza, takeout and catering. Now we're gonna go inside and we're gonna meet not one, but two chefs right here at the Red Door Cucina. dedication to authenticity when it comes to the food here at Red Door is unparalleled. Because right now, I'm super excited to introduce you to our first chef, Chef Tommaso. Hi. Pleasure nice to, to meet nice you. Nice to meet you too. Tommaso has been flown in from South Carolina to teach the crew here at Red Door how to properly make pizza dough. Yeah, now you've spent a lot of time in Italy. You're born and raised in Italy. Yes, I am. Oh, this is where you're going to get that quality. So tell me how you make this dough. Okay, so we'll start from yeast. Okay. I put in a water, in a water that is not that too cold. Okay, so what kind of water? So this is just like kind of room temperature? Kind of a little colder than room temperature, okay. you know? And then I had just a little bit of flour. So you're making this by hand. I mean, I go to pizza yes. restaurants all the time and everything goes into a mixer and the dough hook starts spinning and it starts moving around, but you are not messing around here. No, that's, it's as simple. I, I like the way the dough feels and uh, you know, you can re definitely know when the dough is ready. And then I put some salt. Okay, so salt. What kind of flour are you using? I'm using a double zero flour from Italy and from a company they call Pivetti and it comes from Bologna and actually is the golden triangle of Italy for soft wheat. That's a little different on the flour that's being used in, the, in North America that's usually hard wheat. So soft wheat achieves a, cr a crust they're usually a little lighter, a little softer. Okay. And, and is that what the double zero means? Like, what does the double zero mean for people who are watching at home who might not know what that is? Yes, usually double zero, actually, uh, and lots of people think is about the grain, about the grain is, but actually it's about the ash content. So it's about how much ash are left in the flour. So huh. just to make an example, you know, double zero, a very low ash content compared to whole wheat has a lot of ash content. So, you know, in order to have, it's the most in, inside part of the grain. So it's That's like what it is. The, the heart, the heart of, the grain. of the grain. Yeah, see, the yes. heart of the grain goes into the heart and soul of the dough. I yes, love it. Yes, correct. 
So you're just gently mixing this together, yes. you're removing the clumps, you're just sort of bringing it together. Yes, and what I'm doing right now, I'm just trying to incorporate some air into the dough, and um, you know, because it's mixed by hand, there is a little techni technique, just uh, building it slowly, until I get enough elasticity from the dough. Okay. And uh, you know, and the magic will be done. This is so cool. I've never seen it done like this. Like I've, or, or at least not on a large, a larger scale like this. This is great. Now we are at the point that we build some elasticity in the dough. Mm -hmm. And I usually to like at this point, had a little olive oil, you know, for the crust. Okay. And uh, what does at this point, it lubricates the gluten. And when I do hand mixing, I find it a little easier to mix, you know. Right. And uh, smooth up the dough. Because you can feel it, right? I mean, right. it's, it's you're, you're kind of getting, you know, getting intimate and in touch with the dough itself as opposed to just sort of watching it in the mixer. Yes. You're slightly out of breath here, my friend. Is this me? There's there's work there's work involved in this. A I mean, little bit. This is a this the is a big of ball passion, of dough. Lots, lots of passion, lots of passion, a lot of work, but you know, that's what you need to do for a good crust. Well, that's what it's all about. You can see you're getting this nice sort of sheen, this nice gloss, yes. and pretty much all of that flour that you had in there has been incorporated into this dough and he hasn't stopped kneading this at all by hand this whole time every last little bit has gone in just like that that is what is going to make this exceptional so now the trick about hand mixing we're going to let it sit okay for five ten minutes right and then we work it for like a couple minutes and the dough is done that's it that's it. That is This is the part where I want it. I get the elasticity that I want it, but if I keep working it, it's just gonna keep breaking. So now the rest is gonna do the job. And you're gonna then take it from there. After it's sat for about 10 minutes, you're gonna portion it out. You're gonna put it out onto a tray, and then you probably, do you let that sit overnight? Or? Yes, we usually do at least 24 hours fermentation. Fantastic. To get most of the flavors out of the crust, you know, that's what you want. And that is probably the biggest misconception when it comes to pizza dough is that the time that it sits is to develop the texture of the dough. It's not, it's to build the flavor of yes, the dough. Correct. Well, that is absolutely, oh, oh that's okay. Thank chef, you. chef hands, my thank friend, you. that is fantastic. <laughs> and we are now gonna take this and we are gonna go meet Adrian, who is gonna be building this for you every day. So I just got a hands-on lesson on how they make their dough here at Red Door from a pro that was brought in just for here. Now I'm excited to introduce you to Adrian. Adrian, dude, you've been here right from the very beginning, right? Yes, I have. Awesome, so you're gonna take this dough and make magic with it. Pretty much, yes. That's incredible, that's, <laughs> that's really cool. Here. So what yeah. are you making? I'm making the Porta Rosa. It's our specialty pizza. Most popular. Okay. It stands for Red Door. All right. I see. Oh. Yes. <laughs> All right. It stands for Red Door. I get it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Let's do it. All right. Let's start. Okay. So we start off with our dough. We let it sit out of the fridge for a bit just to make it more playable. Okay. So how long does it sit out? Like you pull it out of the out of the fridge for how long? I'd say at least ten minutes. Okay. Just bringing it up to temperature. You don't want the dough to be cold when you're when you're dealing with it. Okay. You're getting right in there and you're just sort of gently stretching this out with your fingertips and yes. you know. You want to use mostly the fingertips, not so much your palm or hand. Okay. Yeah. And you kind of want to form a nice crust. So you want to push that out. All right, now you want to hang it off the side a bit and just turn as you go. The weight kind of pulls it. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. I've never seen it done like that before, like off the edge of the table. That's great. Yes. You can throw it up a little bit if you want. Oh, here we go. Stretch the outside. See, I, I've tried to do that before. Not for me. It's a lot more difficult Not for than me. it looks, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right, so we flour our board here, our wood board. Help it to not stick. So now we start with the base, which is a garlic oil. So you start from the middle and just slowly stretch it out. Get some garlic in there, nice chunks. Oh, the garlic oh. is so strong. It is strong, it's what makes the pizza though. Oh yeah. Okay, now we move on to the uh, mozzarella. You wanna spread it evenly. Now we move on to the Asiago. It's the real flavor of the pizza. All right, now we're putting on our freshly sliced pancetta. Oh. 
All right, now we move on to the caramelized onions. Nice. You want to kind of stretch them out. You don't want them to be too chunky. Yeah, and now we're going to finish it with a little bit of fresh thyme chopped up a little bit, and that really ties the pizza together. All right, and this is ready to go in our wood oven. Oh, I'm so excited. Okay, so our pizza is looking done. So how do you know when this is done? You want it to just lightly brown all around the crust, every part of the crust. Okay, so you just even cook golden brown all yes. the way around. All right, that looks gorgeous. It smells so good. This whole place is full of that smell. Oh. It looks beautiful. All right, so we start off with our garlic oil oh, around the crust. A little more garlic oil. Yes, yes please. Can never have enough. All right, just a nice even coat. A little bit of basil oil. Just a few drips. Just give it the scent. It's time to cut this baby. We cut it into eight slices. I can hear the crispiness and the like, even just the base because it's cooked on that stone. Like nice that's crunch. incredible. Yeah. Okay, that's perfect. After we cut it, we sprinkle a little bit of arugula, fresh arugula on top. Oh, baby arugula is bitter and nutty and crisp. It's so good. And to finish it off, a little bit of balsamic glaze. That. That we make ourselves. Oh my. Nice drizzle. Goodness. There it is. And this. There you go. Ready to eat. Is your Porta Rosa. That. Like, I can feel the crispness on the bottom. You've got the glaze, the onions. Uh, I can't wait to get some of that pancetta and the garlic. It is just decadent. Mm. Beautiful, mm. isn't it? <laughs> Glad you enjoyed it. I needed to hug that man. That is an exceptional pizza. It's got this great balance of sweet and salty and crisp and savory. The fact that you have arugula and herbs and everything on this pizza, it's just, it's just heaven. Absolute, perfect heaven. I am so excited for you guys. Thank you so, so much. I'm not gonna shake your hands because that's what a pizza is supposed to do. Brother, right, thank no you problem. so, so much. Thank we are you. here at the Red Door. My name is Chef Dan, and this is Hamilton Eats.